uh, a little bit about what we're going to do tonight. Um, it's a college night, but it's not really in a typical college night you might have seen that may be focused around recruitment or meeting people from universities. It's about educating everyone, parents, students alike, on what attending college to music, to study music, is really about what can be like and some of the challenges you might see along the way. So a um, little bit on the format of how we're going to do things tonight. I'm going to start off, uh, sort of do interview style with our two panelists, uh, go through a number of topics that we sort of talked about ahead of time, things we think uh, you may want to know. And then we will take, we'll have, leave plenty of time to take some questions. So uh, make sure you have those. If you're with us on Zoom, you can put questions in the Q&A function at any point in time. They will stay there for us to see. Um, the Q&A is probably better than the chat. If, if people are chatting, that stuff can get lost. Um, so use the Q&A function. We'll get to it. Uh, if you're here in the room, uh, just please try and keep your questions and we'll get to you at the end, I promise. So before we get started, let me introduce our two panelists that are with us tonight. Uh, first, Mr. Darren Jackson, uh, wonderful pianist here in town. He's graced this stage probably as many times as anybody, uh, to be honest. Uh, he attended Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, go Cougars, for both undergraduate and his master's degree. He's performed and toured nationally with Arturo Sandoval, Slide Hampton, Ellis Marcellus, and The Temptations, just to name a few. He's currently the director of jazz studies at the University of Missouri St. Louis, and he's also a teaching artist here at Jazz St. Louis and teaches one of our Jazz U groups. Uh, yes, let's give him a big round of applause. Uh, joining him on stage, and for those of you in Zoom, you'll get to see them in a second, uh, is Dr. Joel Vander Hayden, um, who holds degrees from the University of Minnesota Morris, University of Maryland, and the University of Iowa, where he received his doctorate. He has previously served as director of jazz at both the University of Minnesota Morris and is at Oakton uh, Community College in the Chicagoland area. Per performs regularly with the Missouri Saxophone Quartet, the St. Louis Jazz Orchestra, and the Jazz St. Louis Big Band, as well as his own group. I know I'm going to screw this up. Bihachi, 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 which is a wonderful. Uh, they're playing tomorrow night. We're playing tomorrow night at the Judson House at seven o'clock. I hope to see you there. Wonderful, shameless plug. So, I want to welcome these two in, uh, and yeah, let's give them a round of applause. Um, first thing I wanted to ask you guys is if maybe you could start talking a little bit about your own experiences as, as long ago or as short ago as they may have been, um, with your college experiences, uh, how you chose the schools you went to and how your degrees have been serving you or not serving you, uh, since you graduated. I'll start, I'll, I'll try and be brief. Um, so I, I chose Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville because of Reggie Thomas, number one. Reggie Thomas was the piano teacher, piano professor, jazz piano professor there at the time. He is now at Northern Illinois University, but at that time, I went to East St. Louis Senior, Lincoln Senior High School, and Ron Carter had been my band director in high school. And Reggie had actually also went to that high school. So he was an alumnus. So he would be, come in, he would do clinics. He would bring some of the other professors from SIUE down, including Rick Hayden and Brett Stamps at the time. And so I had a relationship that was just kind of built up with the guys, the teachers that were there. Um, they also, my senior year, did a weekly kind of combo clinic at SIUE that I would go up to um, once a week. And it would be whoever came. It would be high school students and college students all in the same room, all in the same mix, playing together, um, just having a good time, quite frankly. And so that's just kind of how the relationship started with why I chose SIUE. So in the midst of all that, I was... Um, SIUE at the time only offered one full scholarship for music students. 
and their policy, as with a lot of colleges, is see if you can get other money first, right? See if you can get an academic scholarship. So I actually got an academic scholarship. So I got a very small music award because my academic scholarship took care of everything that I needed to do, to do for college. Another um, sign that I made the right choice for me was that that scholarship, that academic scholarship that I applied for, that I got, was actually a scholarship that was found for me by Reggie Thomas, right? He was a teacher there, a professor there, and, you know, just like I might know of scholarships that are available where I teach at home, so, you know, and, and you as a potential student might not. He found something, he was like, oh, look, yeah, this is an academic scholarship. I, I've seen your transcripts, I've seen your records, you're great for this, you should get this, apply for this, and then we won't have to worry about music scholarship money. And so that was my experience with that. So it, my advice, I believe the question was why we chose, right? So then possibly maybe why should you choose? Go somewhere where you have a relationship. That would be my advice with the, the people that you're going to study from. It may not be extensive as the one I had before I went in terms of spending all of that time with those people and just kind of that network of Ron Carter taught Reggie Thomas who taught me kind of thing. But if you've if you met them once, if you met them twice, if you met them three times, if you engaged with them in summer camps, if you engaged with them through clinics, if you engaged with them through 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 master classes and you like the vibe, you know you have no problem doing what they're asking you to do because you trust them and you believe in them. That is a better way to make a choice in my decision, in my, in, in, in my opinion, because a lot of who I am today is based on the kind of instruction, the kind of relationship I got, right? That type of relationship was obviously instructional, mentorship turned into friendship turned into just lifelong a lifelong relationship that defined who I am for the last 24 years <laughs> in a lot of ways you know in that we still connect we still talk we still offer each other help right we still offer each other advice so those are that's why I chose I'm happy I made the choice that I made and it was for all those decisions as for the second part of that question about how has my degree helped or hurt or served me or not served me I went to school and both of my degrees are in performance my bachelor's degree is in piano performance and I think my master's degree is in jazz performance with an emphasis in piano I say that because I'm only trying to get them technically correct <laughs> But essentially, both of my degrees are in piano performance. I actually went into college as a finance major, not as a music major. And what I did was I took music. I took all the music classes that I needed to take except for theory to be a double major and just kind of didn't tell anybody. <laughs> um, because I love music. I wanted music to be a part of my life. But it was... It wasn't a fight in my household, but my parents were very well-meaning and loved me. And they were like, oh, well, maybe you should do this. And, and I was like, okay, I'll do this, but I'll do this too. <laughs> and um, after my first year, I decided that finance was not what I wanted to do. After studying the production possibility curve <laughs> and, micro, and microeconomics, I decided that that was not for me. And so I dropped that, but I had all these music classes, so I wasn't behind, right, you know. Um, and so then my second year of college, I was a music ed major and a performance major. And I was great because I took voice techniques and I had been singing, you know, we sing in the shower, we sing everywhere, you know. I was raised in church, so I was playing and doing that. And I did percussion techniques, which is great because I was a drum major in college, I mean, in high school. And, you know, I was a part of that section. And I played um, just drums, you know, percussion. It was wonderful. It was great. I was amazing. <coughs> um, and so then all of a sudden I had to take, um, <laughs> I had to take techniques for, for, for brass, brass techniques. And I had to take um, like saxophone techniques. And then I dropped music in. <laughs> 
deciding that music education was not for me. And, and when and when you do that, when you major in music ed, you're supposed to do that, right? Because you're teaching K through 12. You're going to be put in a K through 12 situation. So you take all of these techniques classes for brass, for woodwinds, for voice, for percussion. Um, voice and percussion were things I was already familiar with. So those classes were great. Brass and woodwinds were something that I was not familiar with. So I was like, uh, do I want to spend all my days putting my little lifts together to be able to <laughs> play trumpet and I decided that I didn't want to do that and although someone taught me from the very beginning and started me on my journey I was very grateful for that that was not how I was going to best serve the community and that's another thing you need to think about how you're going to best serve yourself in the community and so by my third year I was solidly performance <laughs> but I was also a senior based on credits <laughs> Um, but I was on an academic scholarship, so it didn't matter. So um, graduating from college, I was able to honestly perform, which is what I wanted to do. You know, I hadn't even thought about honestly getting out of college and searching immediately for a teaching position. That was not in my in my view. It wasn't in my sights. So I had the opportunity to do some some Broadway plays um, on tour, had the opportunity to, to go to Europe with jazz vocalists and travel and eventually the temptations and all of that kind of stuff that was mentioned earlier before. And so I was able, while St. Louis was my home, to be traveling a lot in, in my 20s. Um, eventually I was asked to, Reggie Thomas was at SIUE who I studied for, um, from and eventually got too busy, which is a thing that's nice, right? Where he actually needed help teaching some things. So I would come back and teach adjunct for him. And I thought that was a good situation. I was still performing and then I would just come back and teach adjunct, you know? And I ended up, my performance degree led me to be a music director for a church, which actually brought me back kind of full time to do that. Um, and which was nice. I'm no longer doing that, but that was really nice and fun at the time. And so my degree has served me very well because performance has been a large part of my life. And my degree in performance has allowed me to teach on the collegiate level. My degree in performance would not allow me to be a high school, elementary or middle school teacher because I am not certified to teach. Um, and so those are things to keep in mind. Those are not things that I wanted to do either. So my degree has served me well and has led me to um, so to where I am right now, which a degree was preferred for the position that I have. Um, it said so in writing. <laughs> so they looked at that and they wanted that. So I have not been prevented from doing something that I wanted to do because of my degrees, but that's because I've had a kind of clear picture of what I wanted to do and what I not wanted to do, right? I didn't want to teach in public school in terms of K through 12. So that was not a problem for my degree, right? And getting that, I would have to be certified in order to do it. And I can certainly go do that if I wanted to. I hope that answers the question. Okay, Joe. <laughs> Pass the baton. Um, so my, my college uh, search started with just getting inundated and I don't, I'm sure they still do this and you're all getting this type of stuff too, but everything filling up the mailbox, getting all these things from this college and that college and they all start to kind of blur together. And um, so my junior year in high school, uh, my dad took a friend of mine and, and me out on the road and we, we drove around the Midwest and went to visit a bunch of different schools just to get an idea of what these pieces of paper that were coming in the mail actually looked like in person, which I highly recommend doing. Um, and unfortunately, I ended up making a decision that I was going to go to this one particular school, one that I hadn't visited on that trip, uh, because a friend of mine was going there and wouldn't it be fun to room together. And so I kind of decided, and they gave me a, a nice scholarship too, um, but still it was a, an expensive school and it was a private school. And then when I got down there and um, started talking with the uh, the professors down there, I was thinking that, well, if I went to this private school, I'd, I'd have some advantages, right? I'd have 
yeah, I might take out all these loans and, and pay for school, but coming out of school, I'll be more likely to, to get a, a job somewhere or to, to be successful. Well, it was very clear from my conversations that they said, well, it doesn't really matter. You just have to be good at what you do. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so basically they, they were just saying, it doesn't matter that you went to school here. And I was like, oh, really? And so I decided maybe I'm not going to go to school there. And at the very last minute, I kind of decided to go uh, to the University of Minnesota in Morris um, and went to visit their campus. And they had um, a really large jazz program, which was of interest to me. I was like, uh, like you, I, I didn't, I wasn't coming in as a music major. I was maybe a little nervous about that. I knew I wanted to be involved, but I was, I didn't, you know, you get that sort of like fear of maybe I'm not good enough. I don't, I don't know if I should do that. And by the end of my first year there, it was very apparent that the music majors were the people that I wanted to be around. So I was thinking, you know, forward thinking, like if these, if these are going to be my work colleagues someday, I'm going to really enjoy that. So, so that's really what, what kind of pushed me to that. And they had this great jazz festival and I had just an amazing experience with that. And, uh, so I declared my music major the, the second year I did do music ed because I did think that teaching was something I would be interested in and that I do really love doing, uh, today. Um, so there were some, some great opportunities. I was able to direct one of this, one of the four student big bands, um, as an upperclassman. So I got that opportunity before even graduating, which was great. And, uh, and, and had a, had a great time. Um, when I did my graduate degrees, I, I was more, um, shrewd about how I was going to select my school. And I, I recommend this to all high school, uh, graduates looking for a college to, to attend. Find, again, find the person if you're going for music, find the person you want to study with, number one, that's most important. Find the ensembles that will engage you and you will you will be able to participate in and have uh, a lot of fulfillment from while applying the things you're learning in your lessons. And three, just find a place that you think you could make home and would feel comfortable. Now for me, when I, when I did my undergraduate degree, I knew I wanted to stay in the Midwest. I didn't want to travel too far. I was the first one in my family to, to go to college, so I, I wasn't prepared to, to go far away. When I did my graduate degree, I decided um, there was a, a particular saxophonist named Chris Vidala um, who taught at the University of Maryland, and he came out as a guest artist with our university in Minnesota uh, two, two times while I was there, actually. So I developed a really great relationship with him as well. And I was looking at other schools for my master's degree, but always knew that that was going to be toward the top of my list, the University of Maryland, just because of that relationship. And when I went out for my audition and saw the campus, I mean, it was a gorgeous campus, great music facilities and performing arts facilities. And um, I fell in love with it and ended up getting a, uh, a tuition assistantship, which meant that my tuition would be covered and I would, as long as I worked like a, a basically a part-time uh position in the in the fine arts center on campus and then they provided a small stipend on top of that so I thought it was great I had my tuition paid for plus a little bit of money in my pocket and in that time I had just gotten married and so my wife was able to find a, a job out there in the DC area and so that was cool um, upon graduating I real and that was a, a jazz performance degree so I graduated with my bachelor's in music ed thinking, well, maybe I'll do a, just a, a high school teaching job or something like that in, in Minnesota, and then was kind of urged to do the grad school thing by one of my uh, faculty members at the time. So anyway, did the jazz performance thing at Maryland, and then um, quickly realized that a lot, of, a lot of the collegiate jobs that I was kind of targeting um, had master's required, doctorate preferred. And I found that that was kind of maybe keeping me out of some of the some of those positions that I was trying to apply for. So I always had in the back of my mind, I should probably get my doctorate someday. Um, but I needed some teaching experience before that. So that's when I, I moved to Chicago and, and taught at Oakton Community College, um, which is near the, the O'Hare Airport. Um, and then 
then went back and did a sabbatical replacement for my former jazz director in Minnesota and got to do that for a year. Um, and I, I realized in both of those scenarios, I was teaching applied saxophone lessons. And I realized that, yeah, I did my undergrad and it was, it was a, a quote unquote classical saxophone degree, but I was studying with a clarinet teacher and I didn't really, you know, I wasn't exposed to all the probably correct literature and, and that, that I would have been had I been studying with someone who is a serious classical saxophonist. So I knew that was a deficiency in my skill set. And I knew that if I was applying for um, collegiate teaching jobs, that I would need to deal with that because that would be kind of a hole on my resume. So I thought if I do my doctorate, I'm going to attempt to do it in classical saxophone. Well, thankfully, the University of Iowa um, had a saxophone teacher who was only did classical and he needed a jazz TA in his studio. <laughs> and he was also someone that I had met that had come out to my school as an undergrad and had worked with. Um, and his name was Kenneth, is, is Kenneth Che. And so he, I was able to come out and do kind of a similar thing, a, a teaching assistantship at the University of Iowa. And again, get my tuition covered and a small stipend on top of that, which worked out really well because I, I only had to take out my loans for my undergraduate degree and then my master's and doctorate were essentially covered. And thankfully my wife was working the whole time, basically keeping us afloat because that assistantship money wasn't going to do it. So, um, yeah, so that, that ultimately then I finished up at Iowa and moved here 11 years ago, um, from there. So my, in this case, my degrees, I think have served me really well because I'm, I'm utilizing everything that I've learned from the music ed degree to the jazz performance degree to the classical performance degree, um, in my teaching at Jefferson College and at Washington University. So I do applied saxophone at Wash U and then teach music theory and direct the jazz ensembles and, and uh, woodwind lessons and things like that down at Jefferson. So it was a long road. I didn't have a, a permanent full-time job until I was 30. Um, but, you know, I, I'm very, very thankful for all those people that, you know, I, I, it really is about building relationships. So even if you don't have someone that, that you already know, um, it's never too late to, or too early rather, to build that relationship with somebody at a school. If you if you have kind of a college in mind because, oh, I would really like to study with that person, reach out as soon as possible. Even if you're, you know, sophomore, junior, just say, hey, I'm really interested. I want to learn more about the audition requirements, um, what the program is like. Could I meet with you and, and pay you for a lesson? Uh, you know, could we, could we have some time together? And plant that seed because I, I have a student at Wash U right now that two years ago he came out and we had a lesson together and you know he's he was emailing me and and we had this correspondence going and now he's coming in as a freshman this fall so i already know this this student i'm excited i know where we're at i know what we're going to be working on he feels the same way so it's 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 nice one of the hardest things as a as a especially when you're directing ensembles as uh, at the college level is not knowing who's coming in right i mean we we try to create create an ensemble and we're like, well, I don't know who I'm going to have on trombone and I don't know who I'm going to have on this. And if you have already planted that seed, you go, oh yeah, I got that one trombone player that, that reached out to me a couple of years ago and he's still planning on coming here because we've been emailing and that's great. I know I can rely on this person. Um, and, and they're more likely to, to earmark some scholarship money for you too, I think. So um, anyway, that's, that's kind of my story. We can get on to some other topics. Yeah, I did um, maybe want to get into a little next. What do you think some of these different degrees that are out there? And I mean, Joel, you have a an education degree and then performance degrees and, and uh, Pops, you have performance degrees, you know. So beyond maybe even those two, what else is out there and what, what can people explore as they're looking at different careers and different opportunities for themselves? Well, this is obviously an incomplete list, right? Um, in general, the, the performance degrees, the music education degrees, music business, bachelor of arts, kind of with a music emphasis or bachelor of music that's kind of general <laughs> in a way. And you have music minors, um, jazz minors, obviously jazz studies, jazz performance, 
Um, those are typically in the way things are usually arranged. Um, you may find that none of these things, right, exactly fit what you may want to do. Um, I wanted to perform, so that track kind of was set for me. Like, I was like, okay, that's what I want to do. I'm at home in this. Um, there are some emerging kind of things that are happening um, at, 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 at universities across the country. Um, I know there's a global jazz studies degree, I know, I believe at UCLA, and their model is is a US it's US U, UCLA um, their model is essentially it's 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 a degree that allows you to start in a certain track everyone does right you know for for performance things that you will need to know for a career in music but then allows like a different track for like people who want to be musicologists or an academic kind of person who studies music and there is obviously a a need for that right and then you can also continue to do performance or continue to go another way. Basically, degrees that are set up where they know that you want music, at least this art form, to be a part of how you professionally engage in the world, right? How you choose to possibly make money. I think Indiana is one where you can do like all of these different kind of minors, where you might have a minor in nonprofit um, administration, a minor in this and that so i think universities are, are getting hip to the fact that the structure of having this 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 thing that is so set in granite because those degrees that i mentioned music ed are very set in stone <laughs> they are not very movable because and and that's because of accreditation standards right there and that's because of, of of the fact that first of all nasm which is um First of all, the school is accredited for music education, but then you have to be certified after that, right, in whatever state that you plan on teaching. So there are a lot of requirements with that. So that degree is not really movable, you know, in that type of way. So I think universities are getting hip to the fact that not everyone who wants to study music wants to be an educator. Not everyone who wants to study music wants to be a performer. Not everyone who wants to study music, you know, fits into these, these little boxes. They all, however, have a love for music and want that it to be a part of how they engage professionally with the world, so. I think you covered, I mean, you covered most of it. I would, I would add to that that I, you know, I also know a number of really fantastic musicians that play out professionally that they're, they, they work a day job that has nothing to do with music. They didn't study music in college. I have a, a couple close friends of mine. One's a, or didn't graduate, yeah. One's a graphic designer. One's a software engineer. One's, you know, drives a city bus. I mean, they do all these things and then they play music at night and on the weekends and they're, they play at a very high level and on, you know, pretty pretty big name stages and things like that so it's they're doing it professionally but they they didn't go through all of that so I mean there's that option too um, but he's right that 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 things are starting to really open up I think in terms of higher education it's just that we've had this model for so long I mean you even look at jazz jazz studies degrees are still kind of you know they're still new <laughs> new ish right so but it's getting to the point where where that's a more common thing it's a more common thing for somebody to go to school for um but yeah and i think it's always important to talk about i mean the one i think the one degree that really you need to do a specific job to have that piece of paper or the certification is the music ed right and then most of the other things are about acquiring skills yeah, and that's that's if you want to teach K through 12. I mean, if you're looking to teach at a at a college somewhere or conservatory or something like that, I mean that that's just professional experience that or, and or uh, combined with uh, performance experience in in education. So you could get a couple performance degrees and go on and have a great professional career, and they would still hire you even though you don't have a music ed degree to teach somewhere. Now that doesn't always work out so well. <laughs> Some people are not, maybe not meant to be teachers, uh, as as we find out in our jobs. Um, 
but it can work out for you. So it's not, it, you know, you're limiting yourself in, in the K through 12 area to some degree if you don't do music ed. And if that's something that you know you want to do, you know, music ed would definitely be the track for you. But yeah, I mean, there's there's a number of different paths that you can take to get to similar campsites. It It is. I, I would further add that it back to what Joel said earlier. It's about what you want to put your energy and time and talent into, right? Where do you want to place these things? Because when he shows up to a gig or when I show up to the gig, no one cares what degrees I have. <laughs> you know, no one cares that my degree was in performance and not education, or no one cares that his degree is in education or not performance, or you know, or or how many degrees you have or where you went to school, right? You know, you're being essentially hired to execute. Not only to execute, but uplift the energy, the synergy, rather, of the situation. And so that is, and even in education, even in music ed degrees, those are the people that I love, right? It's not everyone is meant to be a teacher. Not everyone is meant to be a player. We, we can talk about all of those things. But people who pour their whole life, their whole energy, their whole being into doing what they're doing are doing the right thing. And so <laughs> that <laughs> whatever you do, do that. <laughs> and I'd be lying if I said every education class that I took as an undergraduate was great. There were some that, that uh, I was not a fan of at the time, but I knew the end goal. And I knew that this was the path that I should take to get to that end goal that I had in mind um, that, that still evolved. I mean, it was evolving all through my undergraduate years even. So I think that's another thing is you don't, you don't have to know what you want to do now. And, you, and it's okay if that changes. You, know, you may have an idea, but if that changes, don't feel like you're, you're abandoning some part of yourself. It's just, you know, we changed. My sister changed majors, I don't know how many times, <laughs> but she eventually found her track and, and it worked for her. So you'll find your way, but some people know when they're really young and some people it takes them a few more years and, and usually the first couple of years of college will really tell you a lot about the decisions you've made thus far and help help you to kind of guide you through the rest. Which is why we talk about how it being so important about where you choose. You're choosing a professor, you're choosing a faculty to follow into darkness. Why I say that is because you don't know. <laughs> you don't know what you don't know, you know? You're choosing someone that's going to tell you something that you have blind faith in. And you should do that, in my opinion, right? That's what I did with my professors. I gave um, them all of myself or over all to them, all of myself to do what they wanted me to do, right? To do the things that they saw in me that I didn't see, to get out of me that I didn't see, right? And that should be the type of feeling you have. Why? Because there's so much that happens. And, you know, at 18, you know, emotional growth um, that happens in, in that time frame. You have to be in the best place for you. And there is no choice that you make that you cannot unmake if you are not in the right place. Um, and I would not be afraid to do that. Just like I changed majors, <laughs> he changed majors. Change schools <laughs> if that's what you need to do. Um, have an idea of what you want out of school, right? Have an idea of what you want out of your professors. Not that I, in the sense of I want to go to the school and meet everybody and be connected and be on a worldwide tour in 18 months. <laughs> Not talking about that, but have an idea that I'm going to school so that I can be the best teacher. Or I'm going to school and or it can be the, you know, in addition to. I can go to schools. I'm going to this school to study with this person because I want to be the best performer I can be, right? I want to be the best musician I can be. I want to be um, simply realize the potential that I have in the most efficient way, right? So, you know, just. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, I remember. Uh, yeah, I was going to say. In terms of him talking about putting your yourself in in the hands of professors that have been around enough to see 
the trajectory of different people is really helpful. And really, I would, I would, I know that I wouldn't be here right now were it not for that professor uh, as an undergrad that said, after my junior recital, said, "Hey, you know what? You might want to think about going to graduate school because up to that point, that was not on my radar whatsoever. I was ready to get my degree, go teach in a, you know, lead a high school band somewhere in Minnesota." And that was going to be my thing. But he saw something in me that he knew if I, if I kept on the trajectory that I was on, that I could have the potential to be successful. So, again, finding the people that you want to study with, that you, that you trust, and that you would trust their opinion of your abilities and your potential can be very important. As you guys are talking about... Um, the real importance of, of relationships and, and building things. You know, we see a lot of students, I think, coming through a program like Jazz U that are often enamored by names of schools, by by some things. How do you ensure that that kind of relationship takes place at the schools you are looking at, you know, or the best you can going into those sort, into that time? Well, if you have a, if you have a professional in mind, professor in mind if you have someone in mind that you want to study from where are they teaching at jazz camps would be one suggestion right if you know you want to study with x professor from x college do they they do a jazz camp x jazz camp maybe sign up for that so you can have a chance to interact with them right um as far as name choice with school and price associated with that um, that's a choice <laughs> that you have to make. Um, I did not go to um, a private school. I had opportunity, like he was talking about earlier too, but price was a factor. Um, this particular school was only doing half scholarships at the time, and they had people more than willing to pay <laughs> the money to go to Eastman, and I just did not want to do that. My parents didn't have the money. And they had more money than me, so I really didn't have the money. <laughs> so um, I chose to go to SIUE, and that was a great choice for me. Um, and I had an academic scholarship. And then for graduate school, um, I didn't really think about it. It was another, you know, we got towards the end, and I was applying, and Reggie asked me to stay on and be a teaching assistant. So I didn't, same thing, stipend and tuition was paid for, so I didn't pay for my second degree. So I am very happy to say that I didn't pay for either one <laughs> of my degrees. Um, and I think, I know that helped me because I know that friends that I have that went to school that were kind of stressed at the end of their college experience with this debt, right? You know, not that they let it stop them or deter them or not that they haven't paid it off, but that was just something that was looming when we would talk that I'd never had that experience and I was grateful to not um, have that just kind of over my over my head. Um, whatever school you have, if you know what you want to get out of it, if you know how you want to experience it, if you are confident in your professor and the relationship that you have and you're willing to do the work, you're going to have a good time. Now, that's not guaranteed whether the college is Juilliard <laughs> or whether it's a one-year certificate. <laughs> um, that's not guaranteed. It's just not because it's not about money. It's not about the money you spend on the degree. Because once again, your relationships can lead to all kinds of networking that can happen. You know, and there's a lot of networking that obviously happens at at prestigious music schools. At the same time, no one's asking what your degree is <laughs> when they're hiring you <laughs> to execute necessarily or where you went to school. Right. You know, I'm going to stop right there for a second. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, it, it really is a difficult balance. I yeah. mean, I, I knew. When I was younger, I knew I wasn't of the caliber to be dropping, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to go study with X player in New York or whatever. I knew that wasn't me. You know, obviously there have been some students in this program that have been of that caliber and have been successful 
in doing so. Um, you ha- you really do have to weigh that opportunity uh, very carefully because um, the networking is probably the biggest piece of that, I think. I don't think that you're going to necessarily get, you know, uh, the, the proportion that you would that you would s- save by going to um, a smaller name school, I don't think you're going to get that much better of an education at the other school, but you will get a bump in some networking ability and, and things like that. So it's something to consider for sure. Um, I think the other important thing is to when you go on those college visits and you're and you're listening in on ensemble rehearsals and things like that, talk to some of those students that are there and get their impression of the program of um, is this private teacher that I'm going to maybe study with, are they around every week? Like will we have our lessons every week or will they'll be or will they be on tour over half the semester and I have a lesson with a grad student? most of the time and see them maybe twice a semester because that happens too and you don't want to put yourself in that situation where you're spending thousands and thousands of dollars to never study with the person that you intended anyway um so it's a it's a balance it's a it's a big balance and and you have to decide first of all i i know this has happened with with quite a few people that maybe they didn't get into where they wanted to right out of high school, right? If if you didn't get into Juilliard or some of these other schools that you might want to get to, so you went and did your undergraduate degree somewhere else and then you got into Juilliard for your graduate degree. You know, they're, they're all they're kind of things that can happen that can balance. And guess what? When when you did that with your graduate degree, you maybe you didn't have to pay as much because you were an assistant. You had an assistantship, a teaching assistantship, a graduate assistantship, you know. So there are ways to navigate and balance that um i also just want to put in a plug for community colleges yes because i teach at one and especially if you you know if you're going to a conservatory that's maybe a a different animal but if you're thinking of possibly doing you know a music ed degree or even a music performance degree a lot of the performance degrees that um you know even at a school like umsel have gen ed requirements Right. You still have to take some sort of math class and an English class and a couple of science classes and civics and all that. Um, the state of Missouri currently uh, has a, a program that helps cover community college tuition if you're part of the A plus program. Um, and all those gen ed courses have now been standardized around our state. So if you were to come to Jefferson College and then transfer to UMSL, all those gen ed courses would be a clean transfer. You'd have no yeah. no problem with that. And especially if you're thinking performance, I mean, like he said, save money where you can and then spend a little more to have some of those opportunities, whether it's grad school or maybe you transfer to, um, you know, to do your bachelor's or whatever that may be. Spend a little money, but you saved some on the front end, so you're not shelling out for four years or six years of that astounding <laughs> tuition. Yeah. So I agree with 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 everything Joel was saying. It is true. Just for Jeffco and also it's already tied in th- right just through the state of Missouri. But if that is something you choose, just simply make sure that whatever you're doing transfers. That's it. <laughs> from community college to 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 university or from university to university or however you're doing it. There are ways to find out like what am I doing right now? Make sure that that travels with me. So I won't have to be sandbagged into losing a year or having to redo some things. And that is a total viable option. There is nothing wrong with that. We just said any choice that you make, you can make a different one. (laughs) And that's good, especially when you're looking at opportunities for money. Right. You know, and because you go to a community college doesn't mean that you can't also be fostering relationships through that band director to wherever you want to go to finish to or rather to get a bachelor's degree right that it's all still about relationships and it's still all about the continuity of you knowing kind of what you want to do and how you want to do that yeah i think those are those are really great points and it's you know if you go to a community college with someone like joel teaching you know 
people that are there can those building those relationships, having them help you navigate that, you know, well, don't worry about taking this because that might not transfer as well to the school you want to go to, but you could take these classes, things like that. Cause I know, I know when I was at SIU, we, we had people coming in from some of the community college with taking music classes or they took two years of music theory, but they got to the four year school and it didn't transfer at all. And they had to take those two years again. I don't know. I'm sure that's not exactly the same anymore. Yeah, not all colleges are created equal. <laughs> so, I mean, you need to know that your program is, you know, going to be something that, that would, would transfer in like that. Yeah, for sure. Um, why don't we shift a little bit just, and real quick, uh, we're getting short on time already. Uh, but I wanted to, I, I did want to talk a little bit about the actual process of, you know, maybe once you have some schools in mind of the timelines of applying, how to navigate that, and then auditioning as well. You know, important things and things you you tell students or have experience with students in your uh, careers. Sure. Um, so in, in my experience, generally, you would apply for a school a year prior to going to actually going there. So if you're thinking about next fall attending a school you want to get your application in um, a lot of schools have have like early admission deadlines and stuff like that where you know it's like I don't know even September probably it's coming up you could apply to a school to find out if you get in um, as far as auditions go those generally happen like early spring semester for the following fall but occasionally they have uh, depending on the school they may have an early audition date as well um, in what well, in the fall semester the year prior so that's kind of uh, i could be wrong about that but is that general? no i mean that can totally yeah. totally happen the thing is it's first come first served <laughs> um um and what joe was saying leads to the next thing scholarships are given definitely in the first part of the year for the you know by spring usually late part without a doubt um for the fall of the next year case in point i'm so usually as well as every college that i've taught it or been a part of i mean their scholarships in april they know who they're giving scholarships to in the fall <laughs> at least by april you know and a lot of times the money is already spent by then <laughs> where where again that's that's an advantage if you've already reached out to the instructor or the program head and you have communication with them and submit your materials uh in the fall prior to attending um, you know, they'll be, you'll be on their radar. So they go, oh yeah, make sure you audition for this early audition date because that's when we'll have the most money to, to give out. And then, and then hopefully you'll get the biggest award possible, which is really the name of the game. Key dates. Um, what's, is it president's day in February? Is that, that's a big scholarship. Uh, that's a big audition day, right? Days that you have off from school typically are like big audition days. <laughs> Um, I never remember what they are because we don't have them off. <laughs> but things like that. So by Easter, everything's kind of done in a lot of ways, you know, and, and decisions are being made. So usually that January, February, definitely by February, people are in auditions and giving out money. <laughs> I'm, I'm also going to say informally. Like, I know there are formal audition dates, but if you have, like, a great YouTube video of you playing a solo with a band or something, um, and you can send a link. Now, obviously, having a lesson with the instructor would be the best thing, because then they can really hear you play and give you a good evaluation of where you're at and know what, what you'd be bringing to the table. But if, if that's not possible, and you can send a link in an email, immediately they have a sense of where you're at and whether they want to secure some money for you. Um, even though you haven't auditioned yet. I know if, if a student did that for me, I actually I had that happen one time. I saw they sent me a, a video, their, their band director sent me a video and I said, uh, yeah, I definitely want them and I will earmark some scholarship money for this person. So please give them my, all my contact info and tell them to contact me right now. So that happens. <laughs> that happens a lot. <laughs> that happens. Um, once again, it's about the relationship, right? You know. And the network send it send it start that relationship if, if if it's the fall if you're starting your senior year 
in August or September or now, right? For those that are you that are seniors now, who do you have a relationship with of somewhere you might want to go? You know, by the end of the year, send them something. Be in talks so that at the top of the year you have a plan, you know, for getting to that place and auditioning, you know. And they would already know kind of how you sound. They already know, you know, they wouldn't ask you to come to audition in February if they knew they weren't going to take you. <laughs> right? <laughs> or give you money or an audition in January. So. There were a couple of things in there that really, really stuck out to me that um, – I and I had a I had a unique experience I think at most of the schools I auditioned at I ended up doing the auditions on non audition days, okay. and I you know I I had conflicts on those presidents days or something like that and I ended up doing it and I I had a great experience doing that because I was you, you know it was just me in a room with the you know the the people making the decisions you're also fresh in their mind then because they haven't listened to twenty five other people. <laughs> Yeah, just set an appointment. That's another thing too. I, we we teach and we're at the school <laughs> all the time. You call the office and it's like, yeah, come through this time, this day, and it's done. So, don't worry about that's another thing too. Don't worry about if you can't make it on an audition day, get in. Now, don't try an audition two months or three months after the audition day. <laughs> all the money may be gone, <laughs> right? But you know, get in. Yeah, I was just yeah, do that early, but you can do it and it can it can help you stand out, it can make it a little uh different. The other thing to think about too, I, I wanted to mention is if you're applying and talking to people in the music department, make sure you're also taking care of the general university requirements. So a you know, a school like SIUE may have a general admission and then you're applying for scholarships and things in the music department that you're gonna audition for separately. You know, versus versus like, okay, I got into the school now. I'm going to show up and declare my major and be, uh, you know, they're going to give me some money. You know, it's those are those are almost in a lot of places two separate processes. So make sure you're looking at that and uh, taking care of that. Most places it's two different processes. Just so you know, everything Andy said is right. Because at at Umso, for example, you can't sign up for a music class unless the music department knows who you are. <laughs> <laughs> for some of the classes. So if you got into the college or, or the university, you were admitted, which is the first step for all of it, then you have to be admitted to the music department to be able to do this, to major in it, which is, I'm sure, the same for Jeff Coe. Yeah. Um, yeah, and also that idea of, of getting lessons, getting relationships with people. If you, as a sophomore, were like, I really love you know, Dr. Vander Hayden at Jefferson College, I love his playing. And you say, can I get a lesson at 15, age 15? And you've taken, even if it's twice a year, for three years, you've you've had a couple lessons with him. And you show up, and you've done work, and you've shown that you, you can progress. And you show up for your audition in February of your senior year of high school. What do you think is gonna mean more to him? those three years he's been had a relationship with you or that five minutes he sees you that day, you know, he's going to have his decision. I've already made my decision. <laughs> I'm not, I shouldn't say that, but yeah, my decision will already be made. That's a formality at that point. The, the, the audition for the school. That's right. Hoops. But yeah, there's, I mean, there's ways you can sort of take those things almost out by doing, and, and not that it's, it's, it's still based on the work you've done. It's not, you've, you've actually done more work than putting together a five minute audition, but you've taken care of that business over, you know, a period of time, you know, so those relationships can be so important. Um, can you talk just real briefly and then we're gonna get into some questions. So if you're with us on Zoom, I've got a few questions in there. If you guys are out here, keep some questions ready and we'll get started in a second. But can you just talk about navigating that audition process? Say you're You've applied, gotten into a few universities, and have four auditions scheduled. How do you get through that gauntlet that is audition season? Be prepared. <laughs> be, I, this, this, be prepared. I mean, as as someone who's been a part of many audition seasons, it 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 
it is su- it's always surprisingly disappointing to have someone who says they want to do this who's not prepared. And by that I don't mean like the greatest player or anything like that. I just mean like oh, I'm going to do this. Oh, I I don't really know this. <laughs> like that kind of thing. You know, it's like just be prepared for whatever you have planned to do. You know, a lot of that process is the same at universities where they want to hear you play through different styles. They want to hear you improvise if you're if you're coming for jazz studies. They want to hear you um how you navigate and play with people, you know, how you subdivide, how you internalize the music and then and bring that forth. So be prepared to do that. You know, you don't have to be the best, you don't have to be cold train on fire in your um in your in your audition you be you and that's great but come prepared you know have you transcribed and then and these are things that are specific to jazz studies and maybe even performance based what what i'm doing but um have you transcribed right do you know the things that you're going to do and when i say no i mean can you explain them to someone else not I sort of kind of know this and I'm going to try and attempt to do this and, you know, because if you put all that practice in, first of all, we all, the red light exposes nervousness, period. The red light is recording. The red light is auditions. The red light is recitals. The red light is, 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 is that kind of thing. And if you prepare the best way you can to the best of your ability, then that type of nervous energy plays less of a part. And so putting your best foot forward is just simply being as prepared as possible and being ready to be engaged in that moment because people are hearing you for the first time and they're making all kinds of judgments and all kinds of snap quick decisions. So um, playing, if, if you choose a song, whatever that song is, just to say Autumn Leaves, have you performed Autumn Leaves with a group in high school before you went to play it at an audition? Have you played it with other people? Because typically you play with other people at that audition. A lot of auditions I have, if you're a saxophonist, we already have a rhythm section waiting for you. <laughs> ready to play with you. <laughs> if you're a bass player, we got a drummer and a piano player ready to play for you, you know, and vice versa for all of that. So it's like, did you just practice this at home by yourself in your closet <laughs> and never play it with anyone? And your first time playing it with someone is at your audition in college? Don't let that be the case. Right. Because you already know that's not how you're gonna, that's going to be done in the audition or done live. So put yourself in a position to be prepared. And that's is whatever that is, whatever you plan on doing, the performances, the tunes, the transcriptions, do them with your friends, play them with your groups in high school at Jazz U, wherever that is. And so when you get to this place, OK, I have played this with people. I've experienced this and this is my time. I would say, he, he said, be prepared a few times. Did you all catch that? <laughs> <laughs> part of, part, I'm, and I'm obsessive about preparation, especially in those kinds of situations. Some other things that will help you to be prepared. One, perform in front of a panel of people before your audition. So whether it's uh, friends, people from school, family members, whoever, put on a mock audition by playing your material in front of them. Uh, two, practice at varying tempos. If you have an up-tempo tune that, that's part of your audition, practice playing it blisteringly fast and a little under where you'd like to play it because if you have a faculty rhythm section, they just might test you out. <laughs> so they don't want to see you fail, but they're like, let's see what happens if we kick ratchet this up a little bit, see if they can, if they can hang. So that will make you feel more comfortable if, you're, if you've done that already before your audition. Um, I would say also, in addition to preparing, oh, if the requirement is learn you know, three uh, different styles, so bring in three different tunes or four different tunes or whatever it may be, 
have a few more in your back pocket. So you can say, you know, if they say, well, is there anything else you could play for us? Well, I'd like to hear another, you know, of this style. You can say, yeah, I've got like three or four different options that I could do right now. What, what do you, what would you like to hear? Nothing's better than, do you have a little more for us? Yeah. And they have this long list and, and you're ready to go. That shows a, a sign of dedication to your craft and that, that you're kind of ready for anything, which speaks volumes about how successful you will be in the program and how reliable you will be in the program. Um, also, research the program. Know about what ensembles they offer, what the, what the degree requirements are, what your degree plan is, who the faculty are, where they've gone to school, what kinds of things they've done professionally. Um, I'm still convinced that part of that, when I was when I was uh, trying to get a job, I had done all of that with all these faculty members, and uh, one in particular was very impressed that I knew all this about them, and they they were the one that was like really driving to to get me hired. Be I don't know if it was only for that, hopefully not only for that, but I know that made an impact on them and maybe helped sway their decision. So know as much as possible about the situation you will be putting yourself in at each one of those schools. In addition, just as a personal note, don't say things like, <laughs> um, yes, I've been transcribing such and such song, this song, that song, because almost always people will ask you to play it. <laughs> and if you can't, <laughs> you're not prepared. <laughs> right? So just be very careful careful about um, <laughs> the audition in that way. Because I do it all the time. I know what you've prepared, and then I go, what else have you been doing? What else have you done? Oh, I've been doing this, I've been doing this, and almost always in the room, for the people that are like, okay, let's hear that. Because people always say cool things <laughs> <laughs> that they can do. They always do. It never fails. I've been doing that, and everybody's like, all right, let's do that. And then they're like, oh, I, I, I don't remember. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> right? The classic, the classic. Well, I th I did that, but yeah, it was a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> let your let your playing do the talking. You don't you don't need to 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 brag exactly. on yourself verbally. Let your playing do all of that. Exactly. I was just going to add too to that. If you're going into you know you're, a, I mean even a junior and you're in the spring of your junior year and you're you're considering this and and say you're looking at. Uh, doing something in jazz, look at all those programs you're doing, check out their audition requirements. There's gonna be some overlap, you know. If there's three tunes at, at each school, I bet one of them at every school is a blues. And so maybe you learn a couple blues, you learn a couple standards that can apply to as many of them as possible. And you, you really dig in on those too. And you're not like, you're not sitting there going, I have to learn 18 tunes for these six schools you probably only need to learn and, and again not that you shouldn't come in with more but you know i think people can can stretch themselves worrying about you know when they get into that process of like if they're not really comparing them and putting them and putting that whole plan together you don't need to do an entirely different audition for every college you go to that's essentially what he's saying you don't you don't you don't have to worry about that you don't need five different audition materials you just need to do what you do very well. Like you said, look at the list. I'm sure there's overlap. A lot of times they allow you to choose, and sometimes they don't. It's still a universally kind of known kind of standard. So, And play to your strengths, too. Don't, don't play giant steps just because it's on the list and you think it'll be impressive if you can't play giant steps. You know, make sure that, that whatever you're doing highlights what you personally do best, not what you think they'll be most impressed with just on paper. All right. Um, we're way over where I want, thought we would be with time. So let's get into some questions here. Um, I'm going to sort of alternate back and forth. Uh, so let me start with something I've, I'm seeing here on Zoom. Uh, and, and you guys talked about this a little, and I can kind of throw this if there's anything additional. Um, what would be an effective way to meet and talk to various professors, teachers at different colleges throughout the mid Midwest? Pops, I know you mentioned attending camps, finding out where those people, you know, teach, do other things. I mean, there is nothing wrong with just emailing somebody you know and saying, like, hey, I, you know, enjoy your playing. 
I want to do this. You know, if, if you start to look at schools, you see so-and-so teaches there, fine. I guarantee they have a recording you can find um, and check that out. So, you know, doing things like that. Uh, you, it, if ever you have any doubt, don't reach out. There's nothing <laughs> wrong with <laughs> when in doubt, reach out. <laughs> um, there's nothing wrong with reaching out to people via, you know, like I said, the email, whatever's publicly available, right? You know, there's nothing wrong with that. What, what are they going to say? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, literally, what are they going to say? Um, don't talk to me about wanting to come to my school. <laughs> well, don't talk that? to me about how great of a player I am. <laughs> What does that tell you about them if they do? <laughs> and, and right, and if that that was the response, what does that right? What does that tell you that you don't want to go there? I, I will also say that as coming from someone that manages a whole slew of email accounts, mm. don't be afraid to send one follow up email if yeah, you don't hear yeah, from them yeah. in like a week or two. Please send a follow. Send the follow up email, and then if I see that name again, I'm like, oh shoot, I never responded. Mm. You know. I, I apologize. And then and then you've got the upper hand anyway, <laughs> right. because I'm like, oh, geez, I'm so sorry I didn't get back to you. Um, but that will that will definitely say something. If you send two emails and don't hear anything, that's not the school for you. I would I would agree. But don't be afraid to reach back out. It's probably not personal. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, do we have any questions out in the live audience? Yes. I think that's Josh, right? Hi, Josh. Well, hang on, hang so on one one second. For the people that aren't in the room, he's asking about uh, teaching assistants, uh, how you go about getting that, and what that can do for you. So that's a graduate school level thing, right? So that's not something that would happen in your undergraduate career. Uh, so in graduate school, there there's opportunities. You can be a graduate assistant, and there are different levels to that, right? There, there's half time, there's full time, there's quarter time, and that all is based on how much money you get, essentially. Um, and so you can be a graduate teaching assistant. Well, what that would mean is that you would have a tuition waiver, you would get a stipend, but then you would be required to teach. You know, my graduate teaching assistantship, I taught a small ensemble, right? I ended up doing essentially Reggie's job. <laughs> no, I won't say that. But it, it, it gets to like things that they maybe don't have time to do, right? And it's not grunt work, and I don't want you to think about it that way because it was an invaluable experience for the rest of my life that I was able to be in these situations. And, and my situation was kind of different. I went from one semester being alongside people to teaching the class that those same people were in. <laughs> the very next semester <laughs> so that was a very very that was a very very weird thing that i was kind of not thinking about or kind of ready for um in in that way because it was just kind of a surprise but that experience that i had with teaching all of that led me to where i am now and so that opportunity is available at i believe every major college and university that they have some kind of graduate assistantship they have some kind of teaching assistantship if they have a graduate program right so that is an opportunity that you can then be in and 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 not pay for your graduate degree you just have to do some work for the university that's how that works yeah and i had a i had a couple different experiences at the university of iowa it was it was a teaching assistantship but the way they had it structured, it was I would teach like a couple students private lessons um, because at that time, like I said, they didn't have a, a jazz saxophone teacher. It was just a classical teacher. So I taught a couple jazz lessons and then performed in their Latin jazz ensemble, which was like a, a you know, sort of a, they had their regular jazz group and then this la specialty Latin jazz group, which I kind of wanted to do anyway. So it was a great, uh, you know, a great experience for me. Um, and then at the University of Maryland, it wasn't a teaching assistantship. It was it was just an assistantship um, where I got to essentially I was put in charge of 
booking a performing arts series. So they had this great big Clarice Smith Performing Arts Center, and they'd bring all these big name people in. And then they had this uh, more local or regional series um, that was every, it was like the first Tuesday of every month, I think it was. It's called Take Five on Tuesdays. And I got to book this series. Like they, I knew nothing, about <laughs> really nothing about that. And they just kind of put me into it, and it was awesome. I, I use that skill to this day because I'm in charge of, uh, you know, I'm the co co chair of this committee that brings performing artists to to the college campus. So all the skills I learned in that assistantship have have benefited me, and and on top of that, benefited me as a musician because I know what the booking side of things looks like. I know how some of those decisions are being made, who I really need to be talking to and what I would need to present to them to make it look professional and that they would they would actually want to, to book a group I was involved with. So. so there's lots of different types of assistantships, different ways to, to get that graduate school paid for. So we have a question, I'm gonna go online again, uh, asking about letters of recommendations from high school teachers and personal instructors and how often are those uh, asked for or required uh, for especially music programs? Always? Yeah, I, I think <laughs> my answer is, on some level, always. I guess the thing is, make sure you ask someone who's going to write a letter about you as opposed to recycle <laughs> a letter about the general belief of music students. <laughs> I, I, I'm always intrigued reading um recommendation letters that that are heartfelt and you know when you're reading a letter um that was written by someone who is invested and loves you because they've seen you and when i say that i mean they've seen your work they've seen your dedication they've seen your diligence they've seen you in the trenches doing what you need to do to be better and so those always speak volumes to me because I, I've seen a lot of recommendation letters that are you know this person is great and excellent and they'll be an asset to your program yep. thank you <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to you know I was involved with this project and um, and, and and David um, was a person who who helped bring it all together. You know, I was able to witness, you know, firsthand the dedication to wanting to get it right and bringing an element to the performance or to the project that would have been lost had they not been a part of it. So. Yeah, make sure it's, make sure those letters are coming from people that yeah. you do have personal experience with. I've had a it doesn't happen very often, but I've had a couple students that will come up to me and say, hey, would you write a recommendation letter for me to this school? And I'm like, I I maybe had them in one like lecture class two or three years ago. And I'm like, well, what am I going to say? <laughs> you know, they got to be in my class. I don't know, I don't know what I'm going to say about, you know, I mean, we didn't interact very much or, you know, if it was a large class or something like that. But make sure it's somebody that knows you that you know what they might say and hopefully that would be a very positive thing um, but yeah it's very easy to tell when a letter is uh just a template that they f put your name on versus something that's from the heart Al although i will say i me personally and this might be different for people at different institutions i don't dwell on the letters as much until i hear you play and see what you're about and talk to you personally. And then if I'm on the fence about something, I'll go back in the letters and try to like read between the lines maybe a little bit. Um, but generally the letters aren't as important as being over prepared with your audition material and ma forging those relationships personally. What Joel said. All right, do we have any more questions here in the room? Yes. Yeah, so the question is about um, 
going into composition and, and you know, doing that as a minor. And, and I mean, that's a major too that's out there and what that can do for you. Whatever you want it to do for you, I guess is the short answer. Why would you, why would you want to get a composition major and or minor? Right. You know, to me, that's, that's, it's, it's about creativity, right? It's about, um, trying to learn and understand how things behave and how I can use that knowledge of how, music behaves to help to help get my voice out right and how i hear music and so i you're you're saying is it a good idea yeah well there's nothing wrong with that um it depends on the school you want to go to it depends on who you're studying with it depends on the focus of that program and what's your intent with get, what's right. your end goal with the composition degree or I I don't think we should make our decisions based on covid hitting again or not. Well, I don't think we should base our decisions on fallbacks. Right. Yeah. Either. But I get I I mean I get what you're saying. You, you uh, being a composer is not a great fallback anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but just to be blunt, I mean, um, but if, you, if you're really interested in composition, do it as much as possible, number one. And number two, reach out to people that are composing in the styles or, or for the mediums that you want to be composing for and make connections there, just like we talked about making them with an applied teacher at a school. I don't, you know, when I was younger, I thought being a composer was like such an abstract thing that there's no way anyone could just be a composer and make a living. But I have two friends, uh, one who's a like a very famous wind ensemble composer um, and one who composes for video games out in L.A. And they both knew from pretty they were pretty young when they knew this is what I want to do. Like I, re I remember distinct conversations with both of them where they were like, I just really love composing. I just really want to be a composer. They were both writing music all the time, churning things out. Some of it was meh and some of it was really good. And, and you know, they, they learned those skills and then obviously went to school and studied with different people and, and probably had composition lessons with other folks and stuff. But but really, we're driven to do that. And if you're driven to do that, it's it's viable for sure, um, especially if you've got kind of a knack for it and, and an ear for it. Um, you can be very successful. Good composers are in short supply. Bad composers, there's quite a few of <laughs> probably. Do it. Um, like Joel said, it's – and a lot of composers I know are also arrangers. You know, um, and so it, it that is a very – that's a skill that's needed and very specialized. Not a lot of people can be arrangers and composers, and, and, and we need them, and that's a, that's a good thing. And honestly, you can be a composer without majoring or minor in composer. You can be an arranging without ever having necessarily took an arranging class, right? It, the people whose music that we study now, they didn't have arranging class in the 30s. <laughs> they didn't have arranging class in the 40s. You're talking about the Count Basie stuff, the Duke Ellington stuff. The, these people didn't go to a university and study arranging or even composition, right? You know, that's not what they did. And you can certainly do that. The thing is, is that I believe if you put the work in, your gift will make room for you. And that's the bottom line. And that's in performance. That's in composition. That's in arranging. That's in music ed. That's in whatever you choose to do. Another thing, too, and this isn't true just for composition, but I know some younger composers that kind of idolize certain people and maybe those people weren't you know bringing in millions yet but they were kind of up and coming people they were looking up to and they would offer to edit their compositions so if you get really good at you know notation software and you can create a nice clean presentable page say hey send me all your stuff you're working on and i'll edit it for you um the composer friend the band composer friend of mine um at one point in time was was just that's like kind of grunt, grunt work you know it's like it's annoying it's not the fun part of composition and he was just sending his scores to to somebody and paying them 
to edit them for him. So I'm sure that, you know, that's a relationship that's forming. And if, if that person had something they were working on and they sent it to him, I'm sure he would listen to it and give feedback and, you know, help them advance their career. So, you know, e even if it's, even if you're interested in performance, find those people that are performing and offer to, to help them or, or, you know, what can I do to, to shadow you or to, you know, maybe it's like printing, printing up, uh, scores for a rehearsal or, 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 th or charts for a rehearsal and getting them organized or, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do that will really ease the burden on somebody and change the tone of your relationship and, and allow them to, to see you as somebody that's like, Hey, yeah, this is a good person. And they're really, they're really helpful. And then they'll speak highly of you when, when they're talking about you and hopefully get you, get you plugged into some situations where you may not otherwise have been. And, that can change some of the questions you ask. I mean, I knew a lot of people that um, they got a chance in college to write and have their stuff performed. You know, so if you're if you're going to school, say, hey, I'm really into this. Would I, you know, even if it's maybe not the top jazz band, but I'm writing for jazz bands, can will one of the bands take a listen to it? And a lot of schools will say yes. You know, and you can find that out. You know, but you maybe not go to North Texas and have the one o'clock band read your your chart you know but yeah the seven o'clock band <laughs> they might but that's still a, that's still a good experience because you'll never get you'll never get the feedback you get of having an ensemble play your stuff you know so so that thing and that following you know following composers you like who's writing do you like the same way you might chase a player and maybe they're not a composition professor you know but maybe they're maybe there's just a you know, the the head of the jazz department at SIUE when when Pops and I were there was a great writer and arranger. And, you know, he he mentored a lot of people that did that. So, you know, there's even though that wasn't he wasn't a composition professor, anything like that. So there's it's similar to performance, I think, in that there's it's about the skill you develop and the relationships you build. And you can find that in a number of paths. Start to to, to look through some things and trace the the vibe the sounds the compositions that you're into and reach out to those people all right i have a question that talks about um studying specifically music and science but but maybe taking this more broadly s studying something completely unrelated either majoring in one minoring in the other or, or i've you know double majoring what kind of possibilities are and what's the feasibility of those things the sky's the limit. <laughs> it may not be healthy, <laughs> but the sky's the limit. The feasibility of doing... I was a finance major and essentially a music major my freshman year. That is not how I would like to have continued the rest of my degree. You know, it was exhausting. It was, it, it, it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot, and I was able to accomplish it, but one reason why I fully committed to music was that I was like, well, what if I don't do this? My what ifs were big, right? You know, if I don't put my heart in this, if I don't put my soul in this, if I don't put all of my work into this, then I will regret it. It's the same thing. If you have too many things happening, <laughs> you know, if we're talking about the feasibility of doing all of this stuff, you have to decide what's best for you and what you can manage because there's nothing good about in my opinion, necessarily not fully committing to something and being fractured over here and fractured over there. So you don't get the best of both things, right? You're just in a constant state of chaos and, you know, and, and frantic, like, uh, uh, <laughs> cause I got to do this over here and I got to do this over here and I got to do the same thing next week and I do the same thing next year and I have to do the same thing the third year and then the fourth year. <laughs> so, um, it's 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 about you and what you can balance and what you can manage. Um, the feasibility is schools will let you take as much as you want to take, as much as you are willing to pay. <laughs> you know, as much as your scholarship will allow <laughs> to be paid. I'll I'll say too the if you're if you're kind of torn between two things like that, a lot at least at the community college level, we offer scholarships music scholarships for non-majors it's all about ensemble participation and when i was at the university of maryland doing my graduate degree um there were a handful of people in the top band 
who were not majors, but they could really play. I mean, they they were majoring in science or you know biology or something else. But if they were better players than you know some of the jazz students, or they got the spot. So if you're a great player and you want to play in that band, but you're worried if you're not a music major, you won't get to or whatever. If you're a better player, you're most likely going to get th- that opportunity. So don't don't feel like if I don't major in music, then I won't get to play in these groups and I won't get to get to have that experience at college and let that kind of weigh you down. That's definitely not the case. I don't use sports metaphors, but it's the same thing about somebody walking, you know, onto the field to like try out if you got the juice it's just your spot <laughs> it is your spot doesn't matter who got the scholarship doesn't matter who who did what or who you know won the heisman last year <laughs> or whatever it is we're talking about it's the same thing joel said it's you got the spot regardless of your major there are people in the, the jazz ensembles the ensembles period and also who are not music majors who spent their entire, in fact, entire college degrees and the ensembles because they love music and they want to be a part of the of playing, but they weren't music majors. So, well, and that's a good question too to ask. You know, if you're wanting to study something else but still play, you know, do you allow people to play in all of your ensemble? You know, some schools do have an ensemble or two that may be reserved for majors only. It's yeah, it might not be UMSL, but um, there you know there are I know like the even at SIUE the top symphonic band that was for majors only, pretty much uh, unless I guess unless they really needed an oboe player. Um, I mean that that's a that's actually a that's a good <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a good point though when you're looking at schools in terms of scholarship money like I had this conversation with um, a, a student that took a lesson with me a, a couple weeks ago he's looking at going to graduate school and but this applies to being an undergrad too if the, let's say uh, I'm teaching at a school and I have a full stable of amazing saxophone players in my jazz band and I get another one that comes to audition but I really have no trombones I need to spend the bulk of my scholarship on recruiting a trombone player so you want to find schools, A, that you vibe with the teacher and you like the ensembles and you like the community and the, the school atmosphere, but also if you're looking for money, you need to find those opportunities where, hey, they really need the instrument that I play in this ensemble and they're willing to maybe nudge a little extra money my way uh, to do that. Yeah, So th- and that comes down to research. For me, it just took a quick, you know, I emailed a few uh, faculty, friends of mine at different schools, just asking for the student, saying, hey, do you have any assistantships coming up um, you know, on this rotation for next fall? And they said, yeah. One of them said, yeah, you know, I'd love to, um, but, but I already have, you know, I'm, I've got three saxophone students that already have assistantships, and I need to offer it to a different instrument. And, and then another couple came back and said, yes, we've got some available, and send them my, my info. I'll give them a free lesson. I want to meet them. Yeah, we really need that person. So, and it, you know, you never know. I, I lucked out with, with the rotation for, for my schools at the ones that I wanted to go to, but it could be the difference between, well, go to this school or go to this similar school, but you get, you know, everything covered here and you're paying out the nose here. Um, so it's, research is important. All right, I, I do have a couple more questions. Are there any questions left in the audience? Yes, Josh. Or no, not Josh. Next to Josh. Sorry. I can't see anybody's faces. Ability only. So, well, let me let me rephrase. Or, I gotta repeat the question Sorry, so yeah. people can <laughs> hear. Um, he's asking if if you do major in something else and play in that ensembles, how much does that affect your ability to play music after college? Then, now you can talk. Ability only. It doesn't matter. People like like he said earlier. 
it doesn't matter when you're on the bandstand or if, if you go to audition for a group, they just care about you how you play. They're not going to ask you your major or what degrees you hold necessarily. You know, they, they don't, at least from my perspective, I really don't care. <laughs> Can you swing? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the only thing that I would say is if, if, you're a, if you're a music major, maybe you're, and hopefully, you're investing more time in developing your skill than if you're majoring in something else. So in that sense, you're becoming a better player maybe, but you could certainly major in something else and still take lessons and still practice a lot and improve um, just the same way that you would. So it's really about your own level of dedication to playing. How badly do you want to play and make that something that you do professionally after school? I think, um, I know I've got a couple more questions online. Um, but just in the sake of time, we've gone much longer than I, than I thought we would wanted to, I do have your questions recorded and I will get answers to you. I promise. Um, same for anyone in the room, please send, if you have follow-up questions, send those in, uh, we will get answers to you, uh, in the next week at least. Um, but thank you all. First of all, thank you all for being here in in person thank those of you uh that are have tuned in or hanging out with us on zoom tonight and and certainly not least of all i want to say a big thank you to uh pops i don't think i ever introduced that that is your nickname <laughs> but uh mr darren jackson and dr joel vander hayden for for being here tonight <laughs>